we've taken a look at, at how we are to grow up in the Lord, how we are to be overcomers in Christ Jesus, how the Lord desires for us not to be stagnant in our faith, because a stagnant pool, all it does is get filled with scum. It's covered with yuck. But when water is flowing through it, it's like a river. The river doesn't have that scum. It doesn't have the, the stuff that sits there. But it's fresh, it's clean, it's pure. And God desires for our lives to be like that. God desires for us to constantly be growing up in the things of the Lord. If you have your Bibles, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse number 16. Be joyful always. We talked about that last week. Be joyful always. Pray continuously. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We talked about the importance of having a joyful heart, living with an attitude of joy. Not because we're happy necessarily about things that have taken place, but in spite of what is taking place, we are always joyful. We are always in an attitude of saying, Lord, I give thanks. I am joyful in who you are in my life. I am giving joy to you. I'm expressing joy because I know, Father, that's what you desire. And it goes into the second part here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 7, 5, verse 17. Pray continually. Pray persistently. Pray without ceasing. The Bible is very clear in telling us that this should be a part of every believer's life. Give thanks Give joy, be joyful, and pray continually. This morning, as we look at this, we're going to see how as, a, as believers in Christ, praying continually is a part of our spiritual growth. How we pray, when we pray, is important in our lives. Our text this morning tells us in this verse that, that our lives are to be filled with prayer. That our life should be one that is an attitude of praying before God. Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, pray without ceasing. This command that's given to us isn't one that we just say, oh, that's pretty neat. God wants me to pray. God wants me to pray all the time. But you see, it's a command that he has given to us. It's not just simply an observation or a suggestion. How are we supposed to do this? How do we pray continuously? How do we pray without ceasing? That command, rejoice evermore. We're always to be rejoicing. But now he's saying, I want you to pray as well. Well, if we're always rejoicing, how is there time for praying? Well, you see, the two are to be intertwined. The two are to come together. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? Well, in order for us to answer that question, let me start off with, what does it not mean? What does it not mean to pray without ceasing? Pray without ceasing does not mean that our prayers are never to have an ending. To pray without ceasing doesn't mean that our prayers are to never have an ending. How many of you have ever been in that situation? It's a, been at Thanksgiving meal or when you've been out somewhere else and you say, well, would so-and-so, would you pray for us? And all of a sudden, this person that you didn't really even know how to pray, all of a sudden they became the most theological, well, most well-versed person in the world. And all of a sudden they went from not knowing how to speak any English to speaking the king's English. Oh, blessed thou art thou God of the heavens and the earth. Blessed be thy name, for thou hast come to overwhelm us with thine presence. And they keep going and going and going and going. And all you wanted them to do was say, Lord, thanks for the food. Bless it to our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat. <laughs> so pray without ceasing doesn't mean that we pray without having an ending to a prayer. That's not what it's talking about here. Because there are those that do that. They just keep going and going and going and going. They're like the Energizer Bunny and nobody else has an opportunity to pray. Pray without ceasing means this, is that we don't take all the time to keep going and going and not having an end. Think about it. If we were to literally never cease praying, then how could we work? How could we eat? How could we sleep? How could we watch TV? How could we go to a concert or a game? We would never be able to even communicate with others if all we ever did was just pray, pray, pray in that sense. I can't be preaching this message here this morning if I am praying at the same time. 
We talk about being you know, able to uh, do many things at one time. We talk about having the ability to accomplish more than one thing at a time. But in real la- reality, it doesn't work that way. It's hard to multitask because you're going to be focused on one thing more than another. It just isn't very practical to do nothing but pray for 24 hours. So the command to pray without ceasing must mean something else. It must mean more than that. I've often heard it said that it just means, well, to pray without ceasing means we must have a continual attitude of prayer. But that's not what it means. It doesn't mean to always have an attitude of prayer. It may be part of what Paul's talking about, but I don't think it is any more practical than praying 24 hours a day. You see, in order for me to constantly be in an attitude of prayer means that my brain function has to be like a computer. My brain would need to be doing very multiple tasking at one time, doing so many different things at the same time. Can I tell you this? The older I get, the harder it is just to remember the simple things to do. There's a plug for Suzanne's book, Simple Things. It's hard to remember the simple things to do. The older I get, it's, man, I can't even remember, what, what do I do first in the morning, you know? <laughs> did I take my vitamins? Did I take my pills? Did I, did I remember to brush my teeth? Oh, man, did I put my deodorant on? I mean, we can't hardly remember all the simple things in life. And yet we're saying, well, we should always be praying. But if we're doing that all the time, then it's hard for us to always remember. It's a whole lot easier to upgrade my computer's memory than it is to upgrade the memory in my own brain. We've all heard that saying, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. You can teach him, but you have to do it over and over and over and over and over for him to get it. The same thing is true with us. We can learn things the older we get, but sometimes we just have to have it put in more and more and more and more. I said this a couple of weeks ago that most of us don't multitask too well. We think we do it, but studies show that most people that think they're good multitasking actually fall short of completing the task that others focus on one at a time. So I truly believe that praying without ceasing means more than just trying to maintain a constant attitude of prayer. It means more than just continuing to pray, 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 so that you can be heard. So what does pray without ceasing mean? What does it mean to have a persistent prayer life? You see, I believe that God's word is very practical for us this morning. I believe that God's word, that he has given it to us, not so that he can fuse us, not so that we can sit there and go, I don't get it, God, what do you mean there? But I believe it is a very practical book. It's a very practical uh, way for us to look at life and how we can understand what it is that God desires for us to do, how we should live our life. So what does it mean? Pray without ceasing. Turn over to Luke chapter 18. I think this passage of scripture gives us a clear guidance, a a clear definition of what it means to pray without ceasing. Luke chapter 18, verse number one, it says this. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Jesus told his disciples this parable that they should always pray and not give up. So what does it mean to to pray without ceasing, to pray continually? I believe it means this. It means to continue to pray and don't quit praying. That in your life, there should always be prayer. Prayer should always be a part of your life. That it should never cease, that it should never stop in the sense that, well, I'm not going to pray anymore. I've given up on prayer. God is saying, and he tells his disciples, I want you to pray. I want you to pray. And the things you're praying for, keep praying for them. Keep believing that God is going to meet those needs. Jesus follows this up with some great examples of what it looks like. He gives us a couple other parables of how we can understand the importance of being persistent in prayer. Jesus would tell the people what needed to be done, and then he would throw out an analogy, he would throw out a parable to reinforce what he had just said. In his parables, Jesus would often compare the the spiritual realm with something familiar to this physical realm. I want us to take a look at two parables this morning that kind of show us, they they give us direction and and, and how it is important for us to always understand what ceaseless prayer is. The first one is found in Luke chapter 11. Turn to Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13. We find a story here that Jesus is telling a parable on the importance of, of not giving up, about being persistent. Here's what it says. 
Luke 11, beginning with verse number 5. Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are already in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Verse number nine. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which one of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? persistence, being persistent in prayer is exactly what Jesus is describing here. He just finishes telling his disciples that they should pray, that they should proceed to always be in prayer in the sense that they continually ask, they continually seek, they continually knock. And he tells this story, hey, there's this guy who, he has a friend that stops by in the middle of the night. He, he just randomly comes to the house at midnight and he, he says, you know what, I'm hungry. Can you give me something to eat? And the owner of the house, the, the friend's like, man, I don't have anything here. But hold on a second. Let me go down the street to my neighbor. Let me go down to my other friend. And I'm sure that he will give me something so that I can feed you. Jesus tells a story that he goes down to the neighbor's house. He goes down to his friend's house and he knocks on the door around midnight. <laughs> And then maybe a little, little flicker of light comes on up in the second floor and, and the gentleman looks out the window and goes, what do you want, Tom? What do you want? Oh, I, I need some bread. Bill stopped by. He's on a journey and Bill stopped. You remember Bill? Bill, you know, he went to school with us. He stopped by and he's hungry and, and I don't have anything in the house. Oh, go away, would you, Tom? I don't have anything here. Everybody's asleep. We don't have time for this. But does Tom go away? No, he says, he says, no, I can't go away. You don't understand. Bill still needs some food. He's got a journey to continue on. Go away, go away. But what does Tom do? He keeps knocking. Come on, let me in. Give me some food. Oh, the kids are asleep. You're going to wake the kids up. Oh, but you don't understand. Bill needs some food. And the Bible says that it wasn't because the friend felt compassionate. It wasn't because the friend said, oh, yeah, this, let's do this. The Bible says it was because of the persistence of Tom, I don't know if that's his name or not, but it was the persistence of him knocking and saying, give me something. I'm not going to leave until you provide. And when the door was opened, he provided him with some bread. He provided him with some food. And Tom went back to the house. And he said, hey, my friend down the street, he gave me some bread to feed you, Bill. Here you go. <laughs> and the Bible says that this is what it means to be persistent in prayer. It means that, that even though it, it may be unexpected, even though we may be embarrassed to ask, that we keep on asking, that we keep going, and that we keep saying, I'm not going to walk away until I get an answer. I'm not going to leave this place until I'm able to feed my family, until I'm able to feed my friends. Even when the friend refuses, he keeps on asking, he keeps on knocking, he keeps on saying, come on, I know you have it to give. The man's persistent. I can tell you this, it certainly wasn't because of his friendship or loyalty, but it was because of his continual, constant, persistent knocking. Jesus points out that God is not like the reluctant friend. You see, God the Father loves us. God the Father, his will is to always meet the needs of his children. If persistence works for a reluctant friend, how much more will persistence in prayer touch the heart of a loving and gracious father? If it works for somebody that's reluctant, how much more will it work for somebody that loves us and cares for us? You see, God loved us so much that he gave his son. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, even before you and I were born. Even before we committed that first sin, God said, I love you. I forgive you of that if you'll come to me. How much more if we go to him with our needs and our requests? Will he be faithful? You see, church, God responds to persistence. Don't stop. 
Keep on asking. Keep on seeking God in prayer. Don't stop. Don't give up. So many times we're praying and we're believing, God, I want you to do this. Lord, I need you to step into this situation. And we have faith and we're going and we're going. And finally we're like, oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm worn out. I'm tired. I, I don't want to deal with this anymore. How many times do we stop short of a miracle? How many times do we fall short of the miracle that was just around the next prayer, just around the next corner, because we just say, well, eh, enough's enough. God says, don't give up. Be persistent. Keep on going. Keep on praying. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Pray and don't cease. Don't stop. Don't give up. Why? Because our Heavenly Father is far more loving. He is far more compassionate, far more merciful and tenderhearted than any earthly father or even any earthly friends. But pastor, you don't understand. I've been, I've been praying the same thing for a week now and I haven't gotten an answer. <laughs> really? A week? Woo-hoo. Way to go. <laughs> oh, but pastor, I've been praying for a year now about this situation and I still haven't gotten an answer. I still, I've been praying for 10 years. I've been praying for 15 years. Pastor, you don't understand. I've been praying for this situation my whole life. But you know what? Don't stop. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep trusting. Keep knocking, keep asking because you don't know that next time you ask, the Lord might say, oh, now is the time for the answer. Think about it in your life. Many times when you go back and you look at your life, so many times we live life in retrospect. We've asked things of God, we've prayed for different things, and, and sometimes we think, man, it didn't happen. But 10 years later, we look back and go, wow, I see how God was actually working. I see how God was saying, no, not now. No, not now. Now's not the right time. You don't need that in your life right now. What you're asking for, it's going to be more of a hindrance than it is going to be a blessing. But I want you to keep asking. I want you to keep seeking. I want you to keep knocking. And finally, we look and we say, wow, I see how God, all the way through, in my persistence, he was always there. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says wait. Sometimes he says yes. But in all of it, we say, I'm going to be persistent. Jesus wants us to learn to keep praying, even when our prayers aren't immediately answered. Again, he gives us another parable to illustrate, to drive home this point, this truth of being persistent. Turn over a couple chapters to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, we just kind of studied this in our Bible study on Wednesday night, and it it brings home this truth again. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Jesus is telling his disciples another story or another parable. It says this. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that They should always pray, and here it is again, and never give up. Always pray and never give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. That sounds pretty worthy, doesn't it? Give me justice. Judge, grant me justice. There's this evil person that's coming after me. Grant me justice. For some time, the judge refused. But finally he said to himself, I love this, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Let me read that again. Yet because this widow keeps on bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that eventually she won't come and attack me. Verse 6, and the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for the one, for his chosen ones, who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice, and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus is describing a judge who who had no fear of God. He could have cared less about what man thought of him. He didn't have any respect for God. He didn't have any respect for his fellow man. He's described as a merciless judge, one without even a sense of morality. He's a judge, but he really didn't operate in justice. He just went out and handed out his decrees however he felt would benefit him. His reputation is well known in the community. Yet Jesus says this widow Even though this judge is known not to be fair, even though he's known not to be just, this widow keeps coming to him and she keeps asking, would you grant justice? Would you grant mercy against my adversary? Would you help me out in this situation? There is this person that's trying to take everything that I have, everything that I own. There is this person that keeps coming against me. Judge, would you step in and and help me out? How many of us in our own lives, we can say, man, I feel like just that, that widow. 
There's somebody that's always against me. There's something that's always happening against me. And man, I just need justice. I need somebody to step in. You see, the Bible says the enemy, Satan, is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is our adversary. He's always going to be coming against you. The Bible says he doesn't sleep. He doesn't tire. He is always going to come against you. But know this, that we have a faithful and a high priest. We have one that sits on the righteous throne of God and he dictates justice to all mankind. And our God, our Father, through Jesus Christ is always just. He is always fair. But he says this, keep coming and asking, keep seeking me and know that in my grace, in my mercy, I will pour out justice. I will meet your need. Even though the adversary is always there, we can know this, that greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Greater is the one who is on the throne than the one that is in this world. The adversary will always try and pull you down. He will always try and dictate how your life should be run. But know this, that Jesus has turned to me. Know that I am your God. Know that I am your Savior. Know that I am your righteous judge. And I will always be there. I'll provide. I'll meet your needs. Someone had taken advantage of this woman, robbed her of what little she had. In her time, it's pretty much meant she was ruined for life. She had no rights, and if her husband was gone, then there was no heir, then everything she had could be taken. This judge really has no interest whatsoever in her case. There's nothing he wants to do, let alone much that he really can do. But look what happens. His attitude changes over the course of time. Why? Look what it says here. Let me read it from the New Living Translation, (laughs) because it sounds great. (laughs) This woman is driving me crazy. You better not think that about your wives, men. This woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice. Why? Because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. She's driving me nuts. She keeps coming day after day after day after day. I've got a job to do, and she keeps interrupting my proceedings. She's always here. She's nagging. She's bugging me. She's driving me crazy. How do I get rid of her? I'm just going to finally rule. And you know what? If I rule against her, she's just going to keep coming back and saying, hey, that wasn't fair. That wasn't right. That wasn't just. So I'm going to rule in her favor. I'm going to rule on her behalf. Because if I rule on her behalf, that means she's not going to have to come back. She's not going to have to keep begging. She's not going to have to keep asking and requesting. You see, this is how our Father in heaven loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. So he says this, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, if you confess your sins before him, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins, even though you don't deserve it. Even though you didn't earn it, even though you have hurt him, even though he has no stake in your life, he says, because you confessed your sins, because you believed on me for salvation, I will forgive you. Go in salvation. Go in the freedom. Just like this judge. Now get out of here and go and live your life in freedom. You don't have to worry anymore about this person coming against you because I have declared, I have decreed over your life that you are free from this burden. The same thing is true in our life. We have been set free from the burden, the guilt of sin and shame. But why do we keep on going back? Why do we keep on saying, well, you know what? That life wasn't too bad. And then having to say, oh God, forgive me of my sins again. You see, the Bible desires for us to once we have been set free to live in that freedom. And how do we live in that freedom? It's through a life of joy and it's through a life of constantly praying, constantly asking, constantly seeking God. What he would not do out of compassion This judge does because of her persistence. Jesus is contrasting who God is with who we are in mankind. God is not an unjust judge, but a merciful father. If persistence brings a response from such a merciless man as this judge, how much more will persistence touch the heart of a loving and compassionate God? Look at verse 7 and 8 again. Will not God bring about justice for this chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. See, the point of both of these parables is to keep praying, keep seeking, keep knocking, because God loves persistence, and he will answer our prayers. Jesus himself is a great example of what persistence in prayer looks like. He lived in total dependence of his father 
Over and over the Gospels, we see Jesus praying. Over and over, he's going to the Father and seeking him. Sometimes he was up early to pray. Sometimes he prayed late into the night. Sometimes the Bible says he even prayed all night long. The Bible says that on the night of his crucifixion, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. The Bible says that he prayed long and he prayed hard. He even took his disciples to pray with him. He said, hey, stay here and pray. I'm going up to be with the Father. I'm going to get more intimate. I'm going to seek his face a little bit closer. But stay here and pray. The Bible says that, that Jesus would come back and he would look at his disciples and were his disciples found praying? No, they were pra- found just sleeping. It's all in the Z's. Jesus says, could you not even parry with me? Could you not even pray for an hour? They couldn't make it an hour. Every time Jesus went to check on them, they had fallen asleep. But Jesus himself prayed through the night. It says in Luke twenty two forty four that Jesus prayed so intensely and with such great agony that his skin began to pour blood through his sweat glands. He was so intense with his prayer. He was so driven by what was about to take place in his life that he was going to his father. And, and it's hard to believe this, but Jesus actually said this. He said, Lord, if there's any other way, Take this cup from me. If there's any other way for mankind to be saved, don't let me suffer the anguish. Don't let me suffer the pain. Don't let me go to the cross and have to shed my blood. But I love what he says after. He says, but Lord, not my will, yours be done. Lord, if there's any other way, let it be. But I know that there isn't. So Lord, I am surrendering. I am giving my life so that those might have life. You see, if Jesus, who the Son of God, prayed like this, How much more should we, in our weaknesses, pray without ceasing? Turn over to Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6, verse number 7. Let me give you one more lesson on how we are to pray from Jesus. Matthew 6, 7. It says, when you pray, do not babble repetitiously like the Gentiles, because they think by their many words that they'll be heard. When you pray, don't babble repetitiously like the Gentiles because they think that by their many words, they'll be heard. You see, when you pray, don't just say the same phrase over and over again, thinking that God's impressed that you took 10 minutes saying the same thing over and over again. Don't just memorize little prayers and repeat them over and over again. No, little prayers are great. We teach our kids how to pray. We teach them little prayers so that prayer gets into their life. But you see, as followers of Christ, we grow up in the things of God. We don't just repeat things over and over again. We go to the Lord when we just talk to him. We repeat what's on our heart. We share with him what's in our minds. Don't just say, God, my friend, it's time for bed, time to rest my sleepy head. God is good, God is great, thank you for this food I ate. Jesus, you are good and wise, I will praise you when I rise. Jesus, hear this prayer I send, bless my family and my friends. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Don't just keep repeating those kind of things over and over, because that's all it becomes, is repetition. And repetition doesn't have a connection. Repetition is just something we do. We do it out of, out of memory, we just keep going and going and going. It doesn't have a personal stake. Take the time to seek the Lord. Take the time to pray prayers that are uh, of importance to you. Prayers that are not just ones that are offered up for the sake of offering them up, but prayers that touch the very throne room of grace. When Jesus speaks of persistent, earnest prayers, he means to continue to lay our needs, continue to lay our desires before him. Never give up. Never give up. Even when they first don't seem to be answered, don't give up. Keep on praying. So why should we pray? That's how we should pray. What does it mean to pray consistently? Don't give up. Keep on praying. But why? What are the results of our continuous praying? Let me give you eight reasons to close why we need to pray without ceasing. Number one, persistence in prayer glorifies God. Persistence in prayer glorifies God our Father. Luke chapter 11, verse 2, the beginning part says, And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Persistence in prayer glorifies God. When you pray, Our Father which art in heaven, holy is your name, glorious is your name, powerful is your name, hallowed be your name. 
You see, when we pray, it brings honor and glory to God because it's taking the focus off of our situation. It's taking the focus off of us. And it's saying, Lord, I understand that you are the most important person to talk to about this situation. It takes the focus off of you running to your girlfriend, running to your friend, and saying, hey, you know, I got this situation. I'm going through this, and da-da-da-da-da, and blah, 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 blah. It says, I'm going to take it to the one who really cares, the one who can hear, and the one who can meet my needs. I'm taking it to the one who is glorified. Number two, persistence in prayer means that it aligns us with God's will. When you pray, pray our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Verse three, thy kingdom come. God, your will be done as in heaven on earth. As it is in heaven, Lord, let it be on earth. Lord, this is what I want to happen. God, you get even with them. I want you to take them out. Lord, I never want them to be around me again. God, you know what they did to me. Lord, you see the situation. You need to do this. You need it. No, no, no. It takes our will out of it. It says, Lord, I want your will to be done. Lord, whatever is best in this situation, I desire for your will will to be done. Lord, I trust you. I just prayed, Lord, I glorify you. I hold you holy. I hold you as righteous. So Lord, in this situation, I am trusting you. Lord, let your will be done in this situation. Let your will be done in my life. Number three, persistent prayer depends on God to meet our needs. Luke chapter 11, verse three, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Lord, I I need to trust in you so much, so Lord, let your will be done. Give me this day my daily bread. It depends on God to meet the needs. Oh, we go out, we work, we labor, we toil, and we reap the benefits and the blessings of it, but friends, let me tell you, God's the one that enables you to go out and work. God's the one that provides that job for you, and we trust in him and say, Lord, I can't do it on my own, so Lord, meet this need. Lord, give me my daily bread. We're not just talking physical bread. We need to be talking spiritual bread as well. We need to say, Lord, give me the bread of life that I can get through the spiritual battles of the day, not just the physical battles. Lord, give me the bread of life so that I can conquer and I can overcome, that my mind would be fixed on you, not on the things of this world. The bread of life that would be rich in me so that I can trust in you. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither is there shadow of turning. Every good and perfect gift comes down from God above. When we pray, when we ask, when we seek, Lord, let my needs be met with your perfect gifts. Why do we pray persistently? Number four, persistent prayer gives us a cleansing from sin. Verse 11, 4a says, Lord, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that sins against us. Lord, forgive us of our sins. You see, constant prayer, being persistent in prayer. Once again, it says, Lord, I have sinned. I have fallen short. So Lord, as I come to you, as I focus on you, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of the things that I've done wrong. And the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. 1 John 1, 9 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Everything we've done, Every sin, every scar, every blemish, every little thing that you have done that has hurt in the heart of God, if we confess it before him, he says, yes, I forgive you. It's washed clean. We don't get that from people around us. Think about it. When we've been hurt by somebody, we hold a grudge against them forever and ever. We might forgive them, but man, we're never going to trust them again. Can you imagine if God treated us like that? Sorry, Wayne, you hurt me. I'm never trusting you again. Forget it. Oh, I'll forgive you, but I'm never trusting you again. I'm so thankful that God forgives and removes my sin as far as the east is from the west. He buries it in the deepest ocean. But at that point, it's saying, Lord, now that my sins are forgiven, I desire to live for you. So I want to be in constant prayer. I want to be persistent in my prayer. Number five, persistent prayer gives us victory over evil. It gives us the victory over evil. Part of the Lord's prayer again, verse four, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why should we be persistent in prayer? Because it delivers us from evil. It allows for us to overcome the attacks of the enemy. It gives us victory over the very one who is trying to defeat us. 
Why should we be in persistent prayer? Because we are taken from our own strength, our own power, and we are filled with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit that allows us to rise above the circumstance, that allows us to say, I see that situation, I see that temptation, but because I am filled with the presence of God and because I am seeking Him, He will give me the power to overcome it. He will give me the power to say, I don't need that in my life. I'm going to just leave it to the side and I'm going to keep on walking and trusting in Him. Why should we be persistent in prayer? Because it gives us the power to overcome the enemy. Number six, persistent prayer gives us fellowship with God. Psalm 63, one says this. You are my God, earnestly I seek you. Again, I'm looking to you, God. Earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Lord, I am coming after you. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to come after you because it is there that I find fellowship with you. God, I seek you with all my heart. I thirst for you. I long for you in a dry and parched land. So many times we get into those situations in our life, man, we just feel dry. We feel worn out. We feel like we're in the desert land and we can't make it through. The Bible says, even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear anything because God is right there with you. He'll comfort you. He'll give you strength. He'll lead you beside the streams of living water. But you have to come to him. You have to seek him. You have to trust in him. It just doesn't happen. We have to be persistent in our prayer. Seek after him. Find fellowship with God. Number seven, persistent prayer. This is something that we all need. <laughs> gives us wisdom from God. James 1, 5 says this, if you lack wisdom, and we all lack wisdom at some point or another in our life, if you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and wisdom will be given to you. When you are persistent in your prayer, you're saying, Lord, I need wisdom in this situation. I need wisdom to make it through this. Lord, I don't know the right answer. Lord, give me wisdom. Holy Spirit, speak to my heart. And God will give us the wisdom. He'll speak to our hearts through the Holy Spirit. He'll speak to our hearts through his word. His word will speak the wisdom that we need. But if we don't ask, we don't get. If we don't ask, we don't receive. Why are there so many people that are just walking around going, I don't know what God wants for me. What is it that God desires for me? Because we don't ask. And when we don't ask, we never hear the reply. We never hear the answer. If you don't ask, you're not going to get an answer. Think about that. Think about it when you're a kid and you're asking your mom or dad for something. Mom, dad, mom, can I have this? Can I have that? You know what? Kids always do it when you're in the grocery store too, don't they? Mom, can I have this? Can I get a pack of gum? Can I, please, 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 please. Oh, please, please, please. I want a pack of gum. And you think about it. They're like that nagging widow. <laughs> and finally, oh, fine. Be quiet. Here you go. <laughs> we ask. And we receive wisdom. Ask and receive wisdom. Keep asking, Lord, I need wisdom in this situation. But if you don't ask, you're never going to get it. You're never going to receive it. Don't just think it happens by metamorphosis. Whoop, whoop, I am wise beyond my years. Just because I am now 48 years old, I have so much more wisdom. Wisdom only comes when we ask and get the answers. Same thing is true with anything in life. You only get the answers when you study, when you try and find it out. When you try and figure it out. I pulled out a, a service manual the other day. I know it's hard to believe a guy pulling out a service manual to try and fix something. But I did because I couldn't figure it out on my own. And as soon as I opened it up and I looked at it, I'm like, oh, that's pretty easy. How many times in life do we try to figure things out on our own and we spend so much time, so much time, when all we have to do is if we ask and we look at the service manual, if we pick up God's word and say, okay, God, how should I get through this situation? And he says, oh, right here, this is how. How much time could we have saved? How much energy spent could have been stored up? How much time wasted? How many lives hurt could have been spared if we just asked? Finally, this morning, persistence in prayer brings us peace. Persistent prayer brings us peace. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says this, Be careful for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. 
And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You want peace in your life? Peace doesn't come just simply by doing. Peace doesn't come by crying out, peace, peace. Peace comes by saying, Lord, I need peace. Lord, I'm trusting you for peace. Let your peace be my peace. Because the world doesn't know how to offer peace. Only God knows how to give us that peace. See, the peace which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I can go on and on with verses after verse that that tell us how important it is to pray. But for us this morning, do you understand? Pray without ceasing. Never give up. Keep on asking. But don't keep on babbling. (laughs) But never stop praying. When you ask the Lord, keep praying and asking for that same thing until he gives you an answer. Yes, no, wait. Keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Pray without ceasing is to pray persistently, earnestly, and at the same time, never losing hearts. We have the instruction and examples from God's word concerning the importance of this command. Our motivation is to glorify God, to align ourselves with his will, to have our needs met, to have our sins forgiven, to have victory over Satan, to have intimate fellowship with the Lord and to find wisdom and ultimately to be free from worry. He says, don't worry yourself about these things, but trust in me. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. In all your ways. Have joy in the Lord. Take the time to pray. Continually pray. Be persistent in prayer. And know that God will answer. Know that God will be glorified. And ultimately know that he will lead you to where you need to be. Why? Because he desires for us to grow up in the faith. To grow up in our relationship with him. Not to stay the same. But to grow up. Grow up in what he has for us. Bow your heads this morning.